All right, Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah 9, I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. The prophet Isaiah writes, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So these are two very famous Old Testament verses, which I'm sure you hear every Christmas time referring to the coming of Christ, where it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. But why did Isaiah write these words? These aren't written in a vacuum. There's a point to it. In fact, the first word in verse 6 starts off with for or because. You don't start a thought like that. You don't walk up to someone and say, because. No, there's got to be something behind this that l will lead to the because. So, well, where do we start? If you go back to the, the beginning of chapter 9, the first word there is, nevertheless. So, that's not the beginning either. You go back to chapter 8, and verse 1 begins with, moreover. No, that's not the beginning either. So, go all the way back to chapter 7. And verse 1, all the way back to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1, begins like this. Now, it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. So this is how you start a section. You give us the historical information which will lead to what chapter 9 is going to talk about. So let's think about this for a second. We have the prophet Isaiah here who lived, oh, around the 8th century B.C., and he lived in Judah, in Jerusalem. All right, so I don't have the map. Imagine a map of Israel. If you don't know the map of Israel, just imagine a strip of land. To the west is the Mediterranean, to the East is the Jordan River, and those are the borders of the strip of land, which is Israel. And up at the top, you got Galilee, then you got Samaria, and right down at the bottom, you have Judah. Or if you want to think of it a different way, if you split it into two, because you remember the history, you had uh, the split of the nation into two, and you have the southern kingdom, which is Judah, and the northern kingdom, which now calls itself Israel, and down in Judah is where Jerusalem is, and that is where Isaiah is and is writing from. So what's happening here? We're told that in the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, so Ahaz is the king of Judah, and then we got Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Amalek, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it. So, we have the king of Israel and the king of Syria are in an alliance to attack Judah and attack Jerusalem. Okay? So that's the context of what's going on. And so, Isaiah, the prophet, goes to King Ahaz. We're not going to go through every verse of the next two and a half chapters to reach the, our main text in chapter 9. So let me just give you the, the gist of two and a half chapters. So Isaiah goes to the prophet Ahaz and he says, don't worry, uh, Israel and Syria are not going to conquer you. God will protect us. But you need to trust God. You need to believe in God that he will take care of the nation. Now Ahaz, who is, oh... How should I put it? He's a politician. And together with all his counselors and military people, they're like, look, Isaiah, I mean, I mean, you're the prophet and everything. And, and I get that 
you're telling us to, to, to repent, believe in God, and pray, and all those things. I mean, that's nice and cute and everything, but this is the real world. And in the real world, we don't deal with, when an army comes down to you to fight against you, you don't say, all right, everyone, let's repent and pray. No, we need to get together our counselors and our wise men and our military and our generals, and we need to figure out what to do. This is a political issue. It's not a church issue. You just... You go pray to God and we'll, we'll, we'll let the big boys take care of this. And God says, Isaiah says, that's not a good plan uh, because you need to listen to what the Lord says with whom you have a covenant. And the plan that Ahaz and his counselors come up with is, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ask for help from Assyria. Not Syria, Assyria. Okay, two different countries. So he said, why Assyria? Well, Assyria is more powerful than Israel and Syria combined. This was the time that Assyria was the, the big world power, big empire. Before Babylon, you have Assyria. And so the king of Judah says, I'm going to go ask for help from Assyria, make an alliance with Assyria so I can fight off Israel and Syria. Now, of course, even this went against the covenant that God had made in the law. God had said, don't make any alliances with any other nations. It, you depend upon the Lord, and the Lord will take care of you. But they're not doing that. And Isaiah spends the next couple of chapters saying, look, you're hoping in Assyria, but Assyria doesn't care about you. In fact, Assyria wants to conquer the whole world. Oh, sure, they'll have no problem going off to Syria, and they'll have no problem going off to Israel, but they're not going to stop there. They're only going to come and try and conquer you. So don't try, try and ask for help for someone who doesn't care about you. They're, they're just looking for their own interests, not to help you. The leaders of Judah, Ahaz, and all his counselors will not listen to Isaiah. They will not listen to the prophet. They don't care what the word of God says. They don't care what the covenant was that they've made with the Lord. And things are getting tricky. Things are getting difficult. Things are, things are not going well for Judah. And in fact, when you get to the end of chapter 8, jump towards the end of chapter 8, because they don't know what to do, and they're not consulting the Lord, so what are they going to do? They start consulting, oh, witches, and mediums, and spiritists. This was very common in the ancient world. Oh, let's just, you know, blood of a hen, and oh, what do the bones say? Or, oh, I saw something flying in the sky. It's an omen. Instead of asking the Lord, they start looking to other ways to figure out if they will have victory against their enemies, what, are they sh what they should do, and so forth. So they basically turned from God to paganism. Look at the end of chapter 8 and verse oh, 19. And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter. Should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? So we have all these people who are alive, and we have the living God with whom they have a, with whom they have a covenant, but instead, oh, let's go to the spirits and to the wizards and all those weird demonic stuff that the covenant with Moses also said we shouldn't be doing, by the way. But let's just do that. Never mind God and his law. Verse 20, Isaiah says, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So Juna needs help. They need advice as to what to do. They've rejected the law of God. And Isaiah says, look, if you're not going to follow the law, if you're not going to follow the testimony of the prophet of, of the Lord, there's nothing left to go to. What, you're just going to turn to demons? You're just going to turn to dead people? If they're not seeking the law and the testimony, there is no light in them. You're not going to find somewhere else other than the Word of God, to enlighten your path, to give you instruction on where you're supposed to go. You've had it. You've rejected it. 
things are going to go bad. Look at verse 21. They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry. It shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. Merry Christmas. So that's, that's the situation that Judah finds itself in. Um, they don't seek after God and his word. Things are going to get bad. They're going to look up. They're not going to find anything. They're going to look down. They're not going to find anything but trouble. And they are driven into darkness. They're, they're just hopeless morally, politically, spiritually. They're in a mess. So this is what's happening to Judah. Everything is going bad and everything is in darkness and gloom because they're not listening to God. And their enemies are going to come against them. Assyria is going to attack them. It's all going to be terrible. The prophet Isaiah, he spends a lot of time talking about judgment upon the nation. But whenever he does, it's almost like he has to take a breath. He has to, he has to take a break. Like he's saying bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff. And then he has to go, but there's, there, is, there is good news. There is hope that's coming. He can't just, just give them 66 chapters of judgment and darkness. He has to say, even though things are terrible, salvation is coming. God will send a savior. So you have Israel and uh, Judah who are just like the world. They're like, we're smart, we're clever, we're wise. We can deal with our own problems. We, can, we are able enough and powerful enough and smart enough to fix our own, our own problems. And Isaiah is saying to them, no, you're not. You need God to save you, which is what we're going to do now in chapter 9. Okay? And this is, Nicole, why are you doing Isaiah? This is, oh, I'm at the risk of sounding... <laughs> this is the message of Christmas right here. That we have made a mess of everything and we can't fix it. And so God sends Christ to fix it. God sends Christ to save us because we cannot save ourselves from the mess that we have made. That's what's going on in Israel, in Judah. And that's what's happening with us. So the end of chapter 8 ends with, Darkness and gloom. They will be driven into darkness and gloom. And then we have chapter 9, verse 1, which says, says nevertheless. <laughs> I love those. Everything is terrible. Nevertheless. It's like there's so many times in Scripture where you have, oh, like Ephesians 2, where you're dead in trespasses and sins and following the prince of the power of the air and following your own lusts and your own desires. And we are by nature children of wrath. But God loved us and gave us life and so forth. So here, everything is bad. Verse 1 in chapter 9, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and, oft, and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. Lots of names there. We don't have a map, but this isn't difficult. So he says, this gloom that has been there is not going to be there forever. God is going to do something about this. And he's talking about the gloom specifically in a certain place. Where, where is it? In uh, Nebulun and Zebulun, excuse me, Zebulun and Naphtali. So you got the 12 tribes of Israel. The, each one had its own land. And Zebulun and Naphtali or two of the uh, tribes that were way up at the top, up in the north in Galilee of the Gentiles, as it calls it here. Galilee is the northernmost part of Israel. It is at the border with the rest of the nations. It's part of Israel, but it's called Galilee of the Gentiles, Galilee of the nations, because it's, they had the most contact with non-Jews, because they're right on the border there. Okay. But not only are they right on the border in having relationship with non-Jews, but they're also 
right on there also they're also the first part of the land that gets hit every time that there's a war think of Galilee up in the north when the Syri when the Syrians come where do they hit first Galilee when the Assyrians come where do they hit first Galilee when the Babylonians come where do they hit first Galilee they're the ones that get hit first before everything else happens when the Romans came in 70 AD to destroy Jerusalem first they went through Galilee and wiped out everything there and wiped out everything in its wake and in, in, in their in their path until they finally get to Jerusalem so this place this Galilee is one of the most distressed and oppressed places in all of Israel and he says nevertheless in this oppressed and dark and gloomy place something's going to happen it's not going to be like that forever verse 2 the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death upon them a light has shined so these people are living in light sorry excuse me they're living in the darkness and there's a light that appears they don't produce the light the light shows up they've been living in fear and darkness and gloom and now there's a light that shines and yes in case you're wondering this verse is explicitly quoted in the new testament and says that that light is christ christ where was jesus born bethlehem and yet you never call him jesus of bethlehem what do you call him jesus of nazareth well why nazareth is up in galilee that's where he grew up he grew up in galilee much of his uh, ministry was up in Galilee Capernaum his headquarters his home was in Capernaum at some point uh, the first miracle that he did Cana where's that up in Galilee much of what we read in the Gospels of Jesus's ministry is up in Galilee in this place of darkness there's a great light that appears and so what does this light do what happens now because of this light verse 3 says you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy they rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil so first you had people who were afraid afraid of of, of war afraid of their enemies that they're going to be destroyed and exiled but now it says the nation is increased the nation rejoices because of this light that has appeared up in galilee instead of them becoming prisoners and being taken away with nothing now they're rejoicing as though it's the as though it's harvest time they're rejoicing as though they've won a battle and they have spoil to share amongst themselves verse 4 for you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder the rod of his oppressor as in the days of midian so the reason for all this rejoicing there's this light and there's this hope and there's this rejoicing now because god has well this this light whoever this is has broken the yoke of his burden has has gotten rid of the oppressor it says as in the days of midian so many times we read stuff in the old testament and we just kind of find stuff like that and we're like i don't know what that is and you would just kind of keep on going it's not that difficult if you just stop and think about it with Midian you know what happened with Midian what was the big battle and the big victory and the great joy that was against Midian it's in the book of Judges with Gideon it sound the same Gideon where you have this sea of Midianites who are coming against Israel and God calls Midian Gideon excuse me calls Gideon to come and fight against the Midianites and he brings 32,000 people God says that's too many get rid of a, the ones that are scared get rid of them you know 22,000 leave and there's 10,000 and God says it's still too many because you know if, if you win now you're going to think that you won because of your own strength so he brings them down to 300 so you got 300 Israelites against this sea of Midianites 
and they win. God gives them the victory. And so there's this great rejoicing. There's this great joy throughout Israel that they remembered forever. They remembered for centuries. And he says, it's going to be a joy like that when we've been delivered from our enemies. Verse 5, For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. So notice now, this victory that has happened is not just any kind of victory. It's not just, well, we don't have to fight now, but tomorrow there may be another fight. No. The warriors are burning up their stuff. The, the sandals that they wore and the garments that they wore is for fire. We burn it up now. We don't need it anymore because now this peace that we have is an everlasting peace. We're not going to fight again. The battle is, the war is finished. Okay, so we have a place where there was in darkness and gloom, but now there is rejoicing, there is light, there is peace. How is all this, how is all this happening? Who's doing all this? Verse 6, for unto us a child is born. This is, this is why this is all going to happen. This is how it's all going to happen. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. So the reason for all this jo joy is because there's going to be a baby boy that is going to be born, who's going to be given to us, a son is given to us reminds me of god so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son and the government will be on his shoulders so there's, there's going to be this person who is coming who's going to be given to us who he is going to govern. he is going to be ruler and he's going to be way better than ahaz and all those other kings that judah and israel have had and he's going to give us four names for this child that is going to be given to us. And his name will be called, in the middle of verse 6, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now these aren't literal names, they're descriptions of this child who is to come. Like early on in Isaiah, he spoke of a child that will be born whose name would be Emmanuel which means God with us. And so all these things are descriptions of this child. And so these descriptions explain why it's such a joyous event, why this, we have this great hope and light and joy and peace. So let's look at these. The first one is, I know there's a comma after wonderful in the New King James. Some translations don't have a comma there, I don't think there should be a comma there. It should be Wonderful Counselor, because it's four names, and each one has two parts. Wonderful Counselor, um, you know, Mighty God, Everlasting So it should be Wonderful Counselor. A large part of the book of Isaiah is Isaiah speaking against all the so-called wise men of Israel against the counselors of Israel, who thought they were so clever, could get things done without God. And, of course, they end up in one big mess. You just see the history of Israel. How did the split happen? Remember how the split happened? Right after Solomon dies, Rehoboam, his son, goes to his counselors. And he says, well, the, the people come to the king, and they say, you know, your dad Solomon... Uh, he was uh, he taxed us quite a bit there. Things were pretty pretty tough. I mean, there's a reason why he was the richest king in the world. Okay, where did he get all that money from? And they said we need we need some we need you to relax a bit on tax and everything. So everything can be okay. and he speaks with these young counselors that he had, who were his friends, and they say what they want you to take it easy on the taxes and stuff. No way. Now now. 
Herod, now that you're the king, you're going to let them do whatever they want? No, you go tell them if you thought my father was tough being the king. He says, oh, I like that idea. And he says, no, I'm going to do what I want. If you thought my father was tough, wait till you see my reign. And the people say, oh, no, 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 no. That's not going to work at all. And the kingdom splits because of this amazing council of Rehoboam's counselors. And you see, and again, in the, in, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is probably for 40 years to the people, you need to repent, or the Babylonians it's going to be bad. And the king advises, and everyone's saying, it'll be fine. Babylon, <laughs> it'll be fine. For 40 years. And finally attacks. They go, oh no. Jeremiah, tell us what to do. And he says, well, now you can do now. Just surrender, or you're going to get killed. And they go, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're going to fight. So they go, and, you know, that doesn't work. They killed it, taken into exile. And then Jeremiah is left there with a handful of poor people left in the land. And they all go to him again and they say, Jeremiah, you've been right all along. What should we do? And he says, well, start rebuilding. What else are we going to do? And they say, no, 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 we're not going to do that. The advisors say, we should go to Egypt and Egypt will protect us. And it's like one mess after the other. They never listen. You, it, Israel's history is a long line of bad kings and bad counselors, unwise, all the way from Rehoboam to Zedekiah, who had the brilliant idea of rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar. So, but this ruler is coming now, who's going to bring an end to all this mess, is called a wonderful counselor. He's not like the rest of the counselors who just make a mess of everything. He's a wonderful counselor. In the Gospel, chapter 7, if you're in the Bible study, we were there not too long ago. Jesus is in the temple preaching, and the send the guards to go and arrest Jesus. And they go, and they come back without having arrested him. And they say, why didn't you get him? We sent you, he's right there. Why didn't you arrest him? And they go, we were kind of listening to him, and we've never heard a man speak like that before. We just couldn't do it. And they're like, oh, you're deceived also, crying out loud. In Colossians 2, it says, are hidden wisdom. So no wonder, Isaiah calls him a wonderful counselor. It could actually be translated, a wonder a counselor. But that's not all. Now it's going to get ramped up. What's the next one? Mighty God. Well, <laughs> the Hebrew, or that's a good translation, mighty God. Powerful God. Well, that can't mean what it seems to be saying that it is saying. And of course, all those who deny the deity of Christ We'll look, like Jehovah Witnesses and others, we'll look at this passage. Well, we know this is talking about Jesus, but when it calls him God, it doesn't mean that he's God. It, it just means that he's powerful. That's all. It just means that he's a very powerful being. That's all. But he can't be the one true God because, well, you know, it goes against our, our theology. Let me just show you something really quick. Um, if you depending on your Bible, it could just be in the next page. If not, jump to the next chapter and verse 20. Isaiah 10, verse 20. Really quick. So, in this passage, it's talking about the restoration people. Isaiah 10, verse 20. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob, will never again depend on him who defeated them. Like, we're not going to be depending on Assyria and Egypt and others like that. But will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. The parallel here is they will return, the Lord, by the way, if you notice, all capitals, which 
is the name of God, Yahweh, Jehovah, however you want to pronounce it. So they will return to Yahweh. That is the true God. And in the parallel in the next verse, they will return to the mind of God. And so you read that, and you say, well, clearly there when it says mighty God, it's talking about the one true God, Yahweh, the, the one eternal God. In fact, every single time in the Old Testament, when you find the phrase El Gibor, mighty God, it always refers to Yahweh, the one and only true and everlasting God. And so you go back to chapter 9, and it says that this child that will be born to is going to be mighty God. And so the Jehovah Witness, or the deity of Christ, goes, well, in every other place, it's talking about the one true God, but there, it's not talking about the one true God. And you're like, well, okay. I'm not convinced. <laughs> this is talking about the deity of Christ here. So it's not a good teacher or a good prophet. This is God in the flesh who is visiting the world. This is what John 1 is all about. How the Word, who is God, became flesh and dwelt among us. Look at the next one. Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. Quickly jump on this. And they say, oh, wait a minute, but Jesus isn't the Father. Jesus is the Son. Why would it call him the Father? This, <laughs> this isn't talking about Jesus being the Father, as in the first person of the Trinity. There are a number of places. For example, in um, with the prodigal son. With the story of the prodigal son, the Father represents who? The Father in the story, the Father of the two sons, represents who? Jesus. It represents Jesus. In, in, the, in, the, in its context, not the Father, okay? But the point here is not getting into the idea. The point is in the ancient world, kings and rulers were often referred to as fathers, the father of the nation, the father of the nation whose job it was to protect and provide for his people. Sometimes they weren't able to. And the people perished, along with their king. This king, this father, this child who will be the everlasting father, so he's not going to stop being the fa a father. To so he can protect and provide for his people forever. He will be their king and their ruler and their father forever. He's an everlasting father. This is what you when Jesus talks about how I am the bread of life, all who come to me and all who believe in me shall never hunger and never thirst because he takes care of us forever. Last one. Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. In all this chaos and gloom and darkness and sin and war, we have peace with this Prince of Peace. And we talked about this a lot already in Romans 5. <laughs> the biggest problem that we have in life is that by nature we are children of wrath, that by nature we are at enmity with God. The problem that we have is that there is this war between human beings and, and God. One of my favorite verses is Romans 5.1. Having been justified by faith, we now have peace with God. We were enemies, but now we have been reconciled through the blood of His Son. It's not that we were neutral and we were just like, well, God can do His own thing, I'll do my own thing. No. Romans 8 says that the natural man does not, will not submit to God. That was our position. But through, we have peace. That is why Christ is the Prince of Peace. Because of our sin, we deserved the wrath of God. We can go back to Romans all over again, Romans chapter 1. But Christ came to die on the cross in our place and therefore remove that which caused the wrath of God to be upon us. Christ took that wrath of God upon himself 
on the cross so that now we can be reconciled to God. Romans 8, 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this wonderful father that is born is the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. When Jesus ascended to heaven and sat on the right hand of the glory on high, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Christ rules over everyone and everything right now. And 1 Corinthians tells us, sitting on his throne right now, he is gathering people into his kingdom. He is making his enemies, well, the Father is making Christ's enemies his footstool. And the last enemy that will be conquered will be death. And after that, he'll hand the kingdom over to the Father and we'll have the new heavens and the new earth. It says, of the increase of his government and peace will be no end. Isaiah, are you sure about all of this? How do we know it's going to happen? I mean, it sounds awesome. But are you sure? Look at the end of verse 7. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We're not going to do it. It's not going to be our own. All the eternal kingdom, eternal world who is, will grow up and become, a, and will be the mighty God, the everlasting God, the Prince of Peace. How is this all going to happen? We're not going to do it. The zeal of the Lord of Christ will perform this. It's about this. And you say, well, why, now that it's Christmas time, why do we rejoice? Most people don't rejoice about this. They rejoice because they got presents that they're going to have, and they rejoice because they see family, and they're going to see, going to have nice meals, and they're going to go on where, you know, it, oh, Christmas will be fine. And all of that is great. All of that is wonderful. I'm not against any of that. But the reason that we can have hope and joy is because of what Christ has done. God does something about it. That's the gospel. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel is let me tell you what you can do. The gospel is let me tell you what God has done. He sent Christ into the world. He sent his son to die for our sins, and therefore we can have peace. Praise the Lord. Let's pray.